saying it now. Okay. All right, then I'm gonna kick it over to Caroline to walk us through what we're gonna be going over this uh, during this training. Hi everyone, my name's Caroline. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I know I know a number of you, but for those I don't know, I'm the organizing director for the Illinois Sierra Club and we are one of the partners helping um, recruit for and organize this lobby day. And thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday afternoon for this training. In terms of what we're going to be reviewing, first we'll review why we're doing virtual lobby day. Then we want to let you know what to expect on this day. We are going to overview the bills that we'll be advocating for. Um, we'll share with you some about what a lobby meeting will look like. We'll also share with you what the rally is going to look like as well as the week of action. And then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. Great. Hi, right. so uh, first off, why are we doing this um, lobby day? So lobby days are an opportunity for constituents to directly speak with their legislators. Uh, constituents are some of the most powerful stakeholders as they are the folks that elected officials should be in theory the most accountable to. They are the folks who elect them and keep them in their jobs. So it's an opportunity for us to show them that uh, their communities prioritize some of the issues that we're advocating for. Uh, this lobby day, we are going to be pushing for a lot of environmental justice issues. As it says on this slide, environmental justice can't wait. A lot of these issues are super critical and deal very directly with people's health and well being. So, uh, we're going to be showing our legislators just why uh, they're such a priority to us. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to showcase the power of our movement. Like already on this training, we have over 100 folks on the line. So, um, our lobby days are an opportunity for us to show just how many of us there are and just how many of us uh, are really valuing policies that center environment and that center equity. And Caroline. And then, yeah, in terms of what to expect, hopefully we'll be having two virtual lobby visits, one with state representative and one with your state senator. These will be arranged, you'll have a lobby guide, hopefully you've heard from them and they will be set up by your lobby guide and your guide will let you know where and when those are it will be probably on a Zoom link or a Google Hangout link. There's also going to be a virtual rally at noon um, on Friday the 18th. So please mark that on your calendar. Um, I believe there's going to be a DJ. Again, we've had the same DJ a couple of years in a row and they're a lot of fun. And then there's also a week of action leading up to lobby day. So these are actions you can take in addition to the rally and the lobby visits that help advance these bills, that help build visibility for these issues. A lot of the actions are social media actions, but there's also a few actions that are not social media actions. And we'll be talking more about each of these. So uh, we keep talking about environmental justice, but just to do a little bit of um, level setting, what actually is environmental justice? Uh, I'm gonna play this brief clip that gives a pretty good summary of what this issue is, as well as some um, context from historical cases across the country on environmental justice. So definitely let me know if folks are having trouble hearing or seeing anything. I can't hear anything. Nor can I. Hi, right, let me see. I can't either. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, try to restart my screen share real quick. <laughs> and hopefully it'll work this time. Hey Caroline, it's telling me I need to uh redo my zoom can i have you actually share this I'm gonna yeah make you for a sure that sounds <laughs> okay <good. laughs> okay you should have screen share now okay give me one second thanks folks for hanging on through these technical difficulties <laughs> thank goodness for teamwork oh yes <laughs> yeah you know usually you have to share audio separately from sharing the video so there's usually a button for share audio.
Okay, let me know how this goes. Let's see. Success. Yes. yes. Nationally, the facilities where we dump our garbage and process dangerous chemicals tend to be located in poor and minority communities. The people who live there have little or no protection from the industries around them, and things could get worse. So there's this idea of environmental justice. It's pretty simple. Communities shouldn't be forced to deal with more pollution because they belong to a certain race, national origin, or income bracket. Yet America has struggled over the years to implement any serious policy that actually protects these communities. So let's lay out the ways the government has failed them. We will not allow one county to become a dump site. The fight for environmental justice took off in 1982, when residents of Warren County, North Carolina, mounted mass demonstrations against a plan to dump contaminated soil in a landfill in their community. The EPA investigated four similar landfills in southern states and found that they were all located in black or low-income neighborhoods. In 1987, the United Church of Christ Racial Justice Commission found that around the country, hazardous waste facilities were more likely to be located in mostly minority communities. Amid mounting proof, the federal government was forced to act. Hi, George Herbert Walker Bush. So in 1992, President George H.W. Bush founded the Office of Environmental Justice inside the EPA. Two years later, President Bill Clinton signed an executive order requiring federal agencies to consider environmental justice in all of their policies, as well as extending civil rights protection to environmental discrimination. But Congress never passed a bill to make Clinton's executive order law. Then came George W. Bush. His administration shifted the focus of the Office of Environmental Justice from protecting low-income and minority communities to all people, leaving vulnerable populations without a federal environmental advocate. Eighty percent of New Orleans, including much of downtown, is underwater. Under Bush, many environmental civil rights claims were rejected or delayed for years. In 2009, after President Barack Obama's election, his administration recommitted to environmental justice. Generally speaking, uh, in this country, a lot of uh, environmentally problematic facilities tend to be located in places where poor folks live. Yet, during the two years Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House, they didn't file a single bill focused on strengthening environmental justice protections. Passing major environmental legislation faded further when Republicans took control of Congress in the 2010 midterm elections. Now, President Donald J. Trump is making good on his vow to weaken the EPA. Environmental protection, what they do is a disgrace. Every week they come out with new regulations. They make it Who's impossible. Who's going to protect the environment? They will be fine with the environment. We can leave a little bit. This budget, a 31% cut to the EPA, $2.6 billion cut away from the EPA. That's what the president wants. As the EPA loses funding and regulations are rolled back, vulnerable communities may very likely fall through the cracks. I'm Talia Buford. I'll be covering these communities and digging into systemic environmental injustice. If you have something to tell me, email me at talia.buford at propublica.org. Yeah, so as we can see, uh, environmental justice is not an issue that is unique to uh, our state or even our country, um, but we do have some opportunities. Uh, Caroline, could you go to the next slide? Uh, within the state of Illinois to make some progress on some of these issues. So we have quite a few bills on the slate for this lobby day, and we actually have um, IEC's Oh, um, Sarah, I see your hand is raised. Um, if you could actually hold on to your question for a second, uh, and we'll have a whole Q&A at the end, and we'll take those, all the questions at the end. Um, but yeah, uh, so we have quite a few bills on the roster for this lobby day. And to walk us through what those bills are, we have um, IEC's Executive Director, Jen Walling, on the line. So uh, Caroline, could you uh, go to the next slide? I'm going to pass it over to Jen, who's going to start us off with our first bill, the Environmental Justice Act. Great. Hi, everybody. So um, this is a little bit different than some of our lobby days. Not that every one of our virtual pandemic lobby days has not been different, 
Um, but we are doing this way earlier than we have ever done it before. And just in terms of the legislative session, uh, that's because they're trying to get done by April 8th instead of their usual May 31st. Um, but this wow. year, it's more important than ever uh, because of the bills that we're working on. And the first one in particular is the one that is our priority bill. Um, and this is House Bill 4093, Senate Bill 2906. And to give you an idea of where it's at, it has been moved out of committee in the House, um, the Senate. Uh, it, we're we're going to move the House bill over the Senate. We're going to use both bills because we want to collect as many co-sponsors as possible on this bill. And as we watched in that video in Illinois, we have a, a problem with um, high pollution facilities, um, polluting facilities in general being located in uh, areas of Illinois that are more likely to have low income black and brown people. Um, our, our laws in terms of permitting allow um, and encourage in some case environmental racism. And so we worked, um, and I, I won't say we worked with worked with the Chicago Environmental Justice Network. We are taking leadership from the Chicago Environmental Justice Network, um, which is six different community-based organizations in the Chicago area um, that have, um, you, well, uh, just I'm seeing a lot of requests for the bill numbers. You don't need to write this down. It's gonna be in the materials that have been sent and we'll go through this again. Um, so, uh, but if you wanna look it up, it's House Bill 4093 and Senate Bill 2906. Um, so the Chicago Environmental Justice Network um, especially prioritized air permitting and air pollution as a priority. And this is particularly important because there are no laws in terms of air permitting that require the polluter to look at any other pollution that might be close by in the area when they're getting an air permit. So they might be um, emitting what are considered acceptable levels of pollution, but it might be in an area where the air is already unsafe. So there are several items that um, the bill does. The first one is that it defines environmental justice areas. Um, and it doesn't just use the US EPA um, EJ screen. Um, this is a bill that um, it, uh, it uh, uses the Illinois Solar for All process that we actually put together through the Future Energy Jobs Act and um, solidified in the Clean Energy Jobs Act. And it uses more criteria to help find areas um, and then the allow communities to self-identify portion, um, that portion there um, is uh, if a community feels like they have it, they, they have uh, pollution and other criteria that would make them an environmental justice community, but certain data or other information wasn't looked at correctly, they would be able to petition the IEPA to be added to the list of environmental justice areas. So um, the, the procedure that we're using is one that um, really helps us to catch, especially in downstate areas where there might be environmental justice areas, because otherwise um, using other screens, we might be, um, they might be overwhelmed by the city of Chicago. Uh, and then the next portion that's really important is that it expands public and community participation. Um, so it requires that the uh, applicant for the permit uh, do in-person public hearings with translation and that they present a cumulative impact analysis of what will happen with the air permit um, if they go into that area. Uh, there's also um, civil rights procedures that are codified in the law. Um, it does create a project bank for fines and fees that are encouraged, incurred in EJ communities so that they stay in the community and that projects come from EJ residents. There's some issues sometimes that happen there where uh, there might be an air pollution uh, uh, violation that happened somewhere in um, one community and then the company does something completely different but environmental in another community. So um, these are really important. I talked about the EJ assessment um, and then um, one piece that's not on here that's super important, oh, expanding public and community participation, it gives a lot more rights to local units of government to participate in the process and make decisions about whether the air uh, permit will go forward. It's really similar to landfills. Um, and then I uh, don't think that actual, the bottom part is, uh, uh, not sure which uh, piece that's from. Um, so uh, just in terms of when you, when you talk about this bill, um, I think the important parts you want to talk about is that it, the, it defines what environmental justice areas are, 
in a fair way that um, allows uh, data to be collected and used. Um, it also expands the ability of local governments and, and local people to weigh in and participate, and it creates a cumulative impact analysis. So those are some of the things that um, this bill does, which is really uh, exciting. And um, you know, when you're talking about it, you don't need to be an expert in any of this like we've talked about. Um, you can really just tell your story about why this is important to you, whether it's in your own community or it's a community that um, you know is impacted and how um, Illinoisans should have clean air to breathe no matter where they're at. Should be clean, healthy, safe air um, that isn't causing um, issues. So we do have a elevator pitch document as well. Um, so uh, that'd be great, but I don't know if you wanna, am I doing these two? So I'm doing all four of them, right? Okay, so um, we also, and then this is a very confusing thing in terms of the bill numbers, um, because, but we will have bill numbers on these. We have two bills that are about coal plants and coal plant closures, um, and they do very simple things, but like I said, we're not positive on what the bill numbers are going to be, and so we'll send that, that around to participants. I expect it to be done by Monday or Tuesday. Um, it's just, we're, we're getting some late help in being able to do it, which is really exciting. Although we do have the coal ash bill numbers for the Waukegan plant. But so um, there's two sets of bills. Um, one is about power plant demolition. And um, this is a bill that would require increased notice and public hearing to communities when any power plant would be torn down. Um, a lot of you may have heard at the beginning of the pandemic in Little Village, uh, there was an implosion that happened at the Crawford coal plant. And that, um, that plant just spewed dust and debris all over. Um, it was uh, just really remarkable um, in, in how horrific that was. And then I know the Wood River plant, similarly, um, there was por portions of it that were demolished in ways that the community didn't know about. So this just requires notice and public hearings to the community when a power plant's gonna be torn down um, so they can be aware of these in incredibly hazardous um, plants being torn down. And then um, it also, we have a really important coal ash bill, SB9, that was passed um, in 2019, and that, that's going to help clean up coal ash in communities. Um, but that bill does not go far enough when it has to do with um, the coal plant vents in Waukegan. Um, so we're working on a bill that will remove the coal ash from Waukegan um, and not just cap it or do other items. And Mark will take your question at the end. So um, great, the next one. Um, so uh, we are also working on Senate Bill 828 as allies to Chicago Votes and other democracy-based organizations. Um, our organizations have had a strong allyship uh, platform, just believing that if we can keep more people voting, we can keep them in the green economy, we can have a better and stronger voice for the environment. Um, and this is, and, and um, in Illinois, uh, one of the populations that doesn't have a right are convicted felons, um, and they've been disproportionately impacted by uh, access to the minority population's access to the ballot. Um, so uh, uh, we're, we think, we said, a threat to our democracy is a threat to the environment. So this bill would restore voting rights for Illinoisans convicted of felonies require dissemination of educational voting materials and clarify needs for vote by mail ballots for those living in institutions which are located outside the voting district where they're registered. So um, yeah, these this is a, a bill that they're trying to run um, this year and I've been working on for a few years. Like I said, Senate Bill 828, it has not, oh, you lost some of my words. No? Have you been able to hear me here? Okay, cool. Um, so this bill, um, so it's gonna look like it came out of the Senate and it's in the House, but a different bill passed the Senate. So it's in the House now and it'll have to go back to the Senate for concurrence, um, but we do expect for it to come to a vote this year. And um, we do wanna talk with folks about it. And like I said, our, our position here is a threat to our democracy is a threat to the environment. We want people to be able to vote. So that's this one. Um, and so ensure CJA workforce funding. Um, 
And then this one is about the Clean Energy Jobs Act and um, our Climate and Equitable Jobs Act that we passed last year. And this one is just a simple fix to um, one of our important, most important policies, which is the workforce hubs. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, we've worked quite a bit on um, equity centered climate policy. So this is, these are um, workforce programs that extend from training programs up until the point at which um, there's investors in these programs. Um, and there's a uh, just edit to make sure that we can have the $180 million that was negotiated for these programs um, and just a, a simple fix. But I think this is a really important part to talk about these equity centered climate policy uh, programs. So um, are we taking bill questions here? I think we can. Yeah, no. And I mean, um, so I don't know. And I'm, I'm seeing... Um, Jill, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this question that you have about people convicted of crimes and their ability to vote. And, um, you know, we're taking the perspective that a number of the laws that have led um, so many people to be incarcerated uh, have been because of their race um, and that those people have ended up in prison um, uh, because of, of racist policies. Uh, things that have to do with our drug law, et cetera. And those people can't participate in democracy and our green economy. And that's, that's our goal there. And I'll, I'll, Caroline, if you want to share a few thoughts too, that'd be great. Yeah, a couple other things. You know, this is Environmental Justice Lobby Day. So it means we're also really focusing on supporting people in communities most impacted by environmental harms. And actually, unfortunately, a lot of times the prison population is really, really impacted by environmental harms. Right now in the Stateville prison, um, which is outside of Chicago, there's a water crisis going on where people don't have clean water and the water is being rationed. Um, and there's also, I've read articles about the impact of climate change on prison populations and just like extreme heat. Um, and, you know, these are basic rights. It doesn't matter what you've done, um, let alone everything Jen said, also all sorts of nonviolent convictions, et cetera. Um, and we are seeing voting rights being taken away all across the country, um, you know, maybe because you get married and change your last name and then your driver's license doesn't work. Um, so the very least we can be doing here in Illinois is working to make sure as many people can vote as possible, especially people most impacted by some of our public policies. Uh, Mark, was your question a bill question? Uh, we also have a question from Brenda on the coal ash bill. Mark was muted. Okay, uh, let's see. Mark, could you better? unmute? Yes, now we can hear you. God, I always forget that. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> anyway, just like trying to remember what CJ actually is, you know, I have to flush that, the old name out of my brain. I haven't been able to do that yet. Anyway, um, I have more of a general question. I've been noting a, a very sneaky counterattack by the right that is uh, shopping the idea that environmental justice means that you're going to move pollution from uh, low-income areas to uh, not low-income areas. It's kind of the usual dog whistle thing of uh, moving it from uh, non-white to white areas. And I want to have kind of an elevator speech that talks about this is about reducing pollution, period, not just moving it around. Uh, Jen or Caroline, do you want to take that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's, um, you know, like that that is definitely the point overall is that it is about reducing pollution to um, everybody, and I think that um, you know what we've seen historically is the success of um, the environmental movement um, has been, you know. 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, white communities that were more affluent 
um, challenging pollution that was being put into their communities and doing it successfully. Um, and, you know, then it moved somewhere else instead. So, yeah, I, I right. do think this is about um, reducing the amount of pollution overall. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, can be successful with some lawmakers. Yeah, I just think that that needs to be uh, focused a lot more, that this is about reducing or eliminating pollution, mm -hmm. not just moving it, because otherwise it could spark a uh, NIMBY uh, backlash. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, Brenda asked a question about, so you're referring that SB 3073 is the coal ash bill, and that, um, that particular bill is only for Waukegan. Um, so it's a bill that um, we've done a lot on coal ash in the other areas of the state, and especially for that particular environmental justice community where it's right next to the Lake Michigan, which is the drinking water source for so many people, we would like the coal ash moved um, and not just um, capped. And it can be moved in the other areas, but it also can be capped in other things. So yes, that is that particular bill only applies to Waukegan. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this. Um, how do we afford the shift in power from dirty energy um, to clean energy? I, I don't know if there's a specific bill that you want to ask that question about, but there is, um, you know, quite a long answer about the, um, the benefits of the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act and um, uh, other um, items. Um, how much does it cost to move coal ash from Waukegan and where would it be moved to? Um, so I think there might be other folks in this who, on this call who might be better at answering them, but my understanding is that it gets moved um, to a hazardous waste landfill. It's very uh, heavy in toxic metals um, and other carcinogens. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the cost is, but it would be something that would be factored as part of the cleanup closure cost from a company. Um, uh, that um, a company that is um, making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I have another additional thought about voting in prisons, if it's okay if oh. I share. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, right now, another thing uh, that goes on is prison populations are counted towards the census, and those are all people who can't vote. And a lot of times, um, those prisons are located in areas where the legislators who are elected are very anti-environment, very anti-voting rights. Um, and so it's like, actually, some people are getting their voice even louder, like they're getting more representation um, because the prison population is being counted towards their community, but that population doesn't actually have a voice. So that's just like another thing to think about. It's not just like not giving some people a voice. It's about like, it then it gives even more power to um, people who are actively like working on uh, stripping democracy and stripping environmental protections and all sorts of other things. There were a couple questions I think we missed. Um, a couple of people asked about the um, small edit to CJA. Jen, do you know like what the like exact edit is? there um yeah and actually i think there may be we started with a small edit but i think there are other actual edits to the aggregate workforce legislation but um the small edit in particular that protects the workforce programs um is literally um changing the word those to eligible retail customers it's a very technical edit that protects the 180 million. Good to know, awesome. All right, um, then there was also- Could you repeat what you just said? I missed it. Oh yeah, so the um, the one change to the, the CJA uh, workforce bill is, is super technical. It changes it from the word those to uh, those customers to eligible retail customers. Um, and, and it's just a, um, uh, it's, yeah, it is really just, um, it's very technical, but it makes sure that we are um, 
connected to uh, like it just it's a technical fix that makes sure we're protecting the workforce programs and the funding for them. Awesome. Uh, then there's also I see a question from Cynthia asking um, what else is in uh, is required with SB 828 like what uh, does it allow for like public input and allowing folks to access like virtual meetings and stuff like that. So um, which bill are we um, are we talking about environmental justice air permitting? Oh no, this one's for um, voting in prisons. Uh, she, uh, Cynthia asks, lots of low-income folks do not have time to attend in-person public meetings. Does it include requirements for allowing public input through other methods, such as virtual meetings, online surveys, engaging with local stakeholder groups, et cetera? So I basically like the It EJ doesn't say Senate Bill 828 in her question though. Yes, yeah, the EJ permitting bill, I think. Oh, it okay. is the EJ you permitting, the, okay, my bad. Yeah, so, um, and I, you know, I would say, um, the environmental groups involved actually um, don't want Zoom meetings. Um, and I know it's the timing for low income folks, but um, there's been a lot of Zoom meetings, particularly with like General Iron and everything that's been going on with that. And the community has been incredibly frustrated with the um, Zoom meetings because um, while it's, it's time and commitment and all that, uh, you know, low income folks may not have room on their phone to download Zoom. They may not have the data access that they need to partic uh, participate in virtual meetings. Um, and it may give the community a way of engaging that's not face to face. So it doesn't include virtual items. And um, Chicago Environmental Justice Network and others um, want to make sure that meetings stay in person because they've seen a lot of um, what they felt like their ability to participate um, denied because of virtual meetings, et cetera. Um, so there are other public input options, including public comments, um, the ability to submit email comments, et cetera. But the thing that they want the most is in-person public meetings in the community where the project would be located so it's convenient to the people impacted. So not just in Springfield or downtown, um, it's gotta be, uh, in, in the area where the project might be happening and convenient to um, community members. So. Hi, uh, then one question that actually is for um, voting in prisons. Uh, would that bill, this one's from Al Parr. Uh, he asks, as for prisoners voting, just like at university, do students vote in their home precinct or university town? Will prisoners be allowed to vote in their home precinct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, cool. Awesome. Okay. Oh, then <laughs> Jackie asks a very big question, which is how do you ensure an ad adequate number of participants? And that one's going back to EJ air permitting. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't. Um, and I, I think like there will be communities that don't need or want that. Well, that don't participate and don't want this. Um, and you know, at least there will be a cumulative impact analysis done. But you know, if a community is not up in arms about a project that might go in their community, and um, at least they will be given the chance to hear about it, their local government will be given a chance to discuss it. So their local representatives will, um, you know, they'll they'll have to look at it and have to see like how is this going to impact my constituents. Um, like there is a formal process that will happen at the local city council. So if you want to put something in. Berwyn, Illinois, and um, you know it's a big polluter. Um, this uh, like is uh, you know that's that's something that's going to be a problem. Thanks, Jen. Okay, I think we'll pause on questions for now and just try to get through the rest of the slides, and then we can take any more questions at the end. So uh, moving on, um, lobby day. <laughs> During the actual lobby day, as we said before, you can expect about two visits. So you should have about one visit with your state representative and one with your state senator. These meetings are going to be set up by your team guide. Uh, once again, if you have not heard from your team guide yet, please feel free to email me or Shreya. I'll throw our emails into the chat once more. 
but uh, email us and we'll make sure to get you all set up. But yeah, they'll be uh, setting up your Bobby visits. You can expect them to be anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour in length. And also uh, just as a flag right now, they are most likely going to be on lobby day, but just based off of your legislator's schedules, there is a chance that you might have a visit outside of lobby day. So you might have your visit a couple days before or even the week after, but you should hear from your team guide with more information on timing and scheduling for all that. And uh, yes, uh, Mavis, you guys are gonna be lobbying your reps in district. Yeah, Mavis, uh, we are lobbying our reps here in district. Should we also lobby them again? Um, I realize this might be kind of specific for Sierra Club people, um, but I know sometimes organizations are gonna be having lobby visits at another time this session. Um, this is lobby day, so still participate in these lobby day meetings. I know for our Sierra Club folks, a number of them will also be doing other lobby meetings later in the session. And that's actually on a slightly different suite of bills. There's a little bit of overlap. Um, so it's really good to do both those meetings. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, and for I'm this one, your lobby- I'm a little bit I know, scared. it's confusing. And your lobby guide will set this one up. So all you have to do is wait to hear from them and then show up and, okay, you know, you. and maybe do the pre-meeting, whatever your, just do what your lobby guide says. Okay. Um, so this next slide is about the meeting itself. Um, I know we just went really kind of in depth into the nitty gritty of the policy. You do not need to be an expert. Uh, the most powerful thing you can do is share a personal anecdote or story or reason why you care about passing each bill. It's also pretty doubtful that every single person will talk about every single bill. So it's okay if you only have things to say about one or two bills, but think about why this matters to you and why this impacts you. Uh, legislators can hear all day about technicalities, but what will really stick in their minds is personal stories. So, you know, maybe you're concerned about the climate for yourself, for children, for grandchildren, for um, maybe you're a teacher and you're concerned about your students. Maybe you have asthma or impacted by another illness that can be exacerbated by pollution, or maybe you have relatives or friends who are. Um, you know, perhaps the economy is impacting you. And so making sure we have adequate funding for building out clean energy jobs and training people in clean energy jobs really matters to you. Um, Maybe you have relatives or friends who live near industry. Um, maybe you have friends or relatives, or maybe you yourself have been impacted by um, the criminal justice system and um, incarceration. And so therefore you really care about voting. Um, so think about how it impacts you. I know I'm just thinking for myself, like for the coal plant bill, you know, I live in Chicago and I remember the day that the smoke steps, stacks were demolished. And I, I don't live in Little Village, but there was a lot of debris where I was at that time. And that was really concerning. And I don't want other communities to experience that. Um, so just spend some time thinking about that. Again, you don't need to be an expert. And if there's any questions that you don't know the answer to, it's totally fine to say, I don't know, we will work on having someone get you the answer. And your team guide will write that question down and send it in to um, Jen or another lobbyist who can get back we pay Jen and others to be the experts, so you don't have to be. What you see is, um, you know, a person who's impacted by these things, who cares about these things, and um, whose legislator's job is to work for you. And then, uh, oh, that's you. Sorry. Uh, this one's me. <laughs> Very good. All right, and then uh, this next slide here that we have is uh, even more in-depth look at what your lobby meeting will probably look like. So here we have a draft agenda to give you a quick little run through. Uh, we encourage our team guides to start out with introductions, especially if you have a bigger group as it gives everybody a chance to speak and give one or two sentences about why this lobby day is so important and why environmental justice matters to them. Uh, then you would move into reviewing each bill um, I, as I mentioned before, everybody should have received some fact sheets. Um, I also dropped the link to that into the chat and you will receive at least another email from me with that link one more time. So everybody should have all the information they'll need to feel comfortable and confident talking about these bills. You will also have a meeting with your team guide leading up to the bill to go through any last questions you have and to just kind of walk through the meeting beforehand and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, additionally, in the resources, 
uh, in the elevator pitches, you can see if your legislator is a co-sponsor of any of the bills. If they are a co-sponsor, please remember to thank them and to ask them to continue to work hard on passing the bill. Uh, it's important, even if, you're, even if your legislator is um, already on top of these issues, to uh, thank them and let them know that these issues are a priority for their, con for their community and they should continue working on them. Um, additionally, as Caroline said, your legislator might have some questions and it's totally fine to say, I don't know if you don't know the answer to those questions. Uh, following Lobby Day, we will be sending around a survey where you can make note of any questions or other comments you have from the meeting. And then after that, uh, as Caroline mentioned, we'll have someone from our staff or from one of our friend's staffs follow up with them and give them all the information they'll need. Uh, but yeah, and then at the end of the meeting, if it's okay with all the participants and with the legislator, we encourage folks to take a screenshot and then share those out on social media so that we can uh, kind of celebrate the day on social media and once again, showcase the power of our movement in another space. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about social media in a second, but yeah, at the end of the meeting, please remember to say thank you to your legislators. They are very busy people, especially this session. As Jen mentioned, it is much more condensed than usual. So we definitely wanna let them know how appreciative we are of them giving us a second of their time. And yeah, that is what your meeting will roughly look like. And this that one's you, Caroline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are gonna have a virtual rally at noon when it, uh, when we don't have a pandemic, for those of you who have um, been to uh, in-person lobby day, we usually have a rally in the rotunda or out in front of the Capitol and it's really fun and we hear from speakers. Um, starting in the pandemic, we started doing virtual rallies and they are surprisingly fun. Um, so we will have a DJ, if you can make a sign, we'll hear from some speakers. Um, and again, it's noon on um, February 18th on Friday, you jump on a Zoom, you all are on this Zoom successfully. So I know you can do that on uh, Friday as well. And then this is me too, or no, this is uh, me. This one's me. Okay. Thanks, Blue. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so then um, as we also mentioned a little bit before, we are going to have a week of action leading up to Lobby Day. So actually starting tomorrow, we are going to, um, a bunch of our recruiting orgs are going to start posting a bunch of actions that you can take to support each of the bills. We'll also be sending around a social media kit with graphics, sample tweets, sample Instagram posts, and everything you'll need so that you can join in on all the action and share those out with your networks and have them take action as well. Uh, but yeah, keep an eye on your email and you'll see a bunch more info about our week of action. And I actually do see a um, question that okay. I should know the answer to, but I feel like Jen will. will. Will we be meeting with our current senators or reps? My senator changes due to redistricting. Yeah, it'll just be your current ones. Um, I mean, we don't know who will be elected in some of those districts. So it will be your, your current lawmakers, but you could bring up that um, you'll be in their new district. Um, you know, if you are, if you won't, don't bring that up. but. Uh, yeah, it's it's we're going to stick with current lawmakers. Great. And then, Jay, you said, is there a Zoom link? There will be a Zoom link for the rally and there will also be Zoom links for um, your lobby meetings or, or Google Hangout links. Um, and for those, uh, you should be hearing from your lobby guide. So um, social media um, is a really, really great way to amplify our impact on this day. Um, so if you can do social media during the rally, that's really great. Um, do a Twitter storm, help us um, use our hashtags and help get us trending. And then also throughout the week of action, there are actions you can take um, to help increase the visibility of each of our bills. When we can't actually be there in person to be like, look, we're 500 people in green t-shirts. This is kind of the equivalent to just show how many, how many of us are around. And I also don't know about you all, but I know for me during this time of being a little less out and about. I spend a lot more time on social media. <laughs> so also people are more likely to see it. So, um, you know, even if, you know, if, if you don't do a ton of social media, this is a great opportunity to learn how to use this tool. Uh, there are toolkits both for the week of action and for the day itself and the rally and just how to make your voice heard. And um, thank you for all who participate in that. 
And we have an example on the right of an amazing Sierra Club volunteer who is great at Twitter and using hashtags and tagging the governor and her legislators. Like this way, these legislators, they're going to get a little ping on their phone and see that there's a tweet that is about EJ for IL. Um, and then I should also say Twill, this hashtag stands for Twitter Illinois. And it's the hashtag that's used for talking about state politics. So that's a really good way to, um, you know, a lot of journalists follow this or legislators and they can see what's going on in Springfield that day. So if you do Twill, they'll see your tweet and see, wow, a lot of people are talking about environmental justice today. And now we'll open it back up for any other questions that folks have. Oh, also seeing one question from Jim in the chat. Uh, there is going to be another training by uh, Faith in Place that is going to be, I'm not sure what all they're covering, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty similar to this one. So definitely if you guys have any folks you know who are attending Lobby Day who couldn't make it to this one, uh, they are definitely encouraged to join that one. Uh, if folks have any other questions, my email is there, uh, as well as Shreya, who unfortunately couldn't make it to this training, but you could email either of those emails for any questions you have, and we'll be sure to get you helped out and set up there. And uh, Robin, I'll be sending out the resource link, or let me just throw it into the chat one last time, and I'll also be sending that around with the recording a bit later. Oh, wait, I accidentally just sent that to Caroline. <laughs> All right, there's the resource link for everyone. And, and All right, thanks, will, everyone. If, if you can't copy paste, I think there's a question. We will be sending this around. If you got an email with this, you also will have the materials and um, you know, do review them like later this week when we have, for example, bill numbers for power plant demolition. Oh, can I add one more thing that <laughs> we didn't say? Um, Team guides are going to be working really, really hard to get meetings with legislators. As Paloma said, there's a chance that it ends up being not exactly on lobby day. But if your legislator is someone that we just cannot pin down, what will probably happen is that you and your team will circle up and write personalized emails to your legislator. Um, Paloma or Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. So just want to let folks know that's the plan B, and that also makes a huge impact. Um, and maybe you plan other ways to make sure your legislator hears from you when you circle up to write those emails. Um, but wanted to give a heads up about that as well. Okay. And if there are no other questions, then we can go ahead and let everyone go a little bit early. Thank you all. Good okay. job. Thanks everyone for Thank hopping you. on. Thank you. Good Thank job. You. Great. Thank you.